This is without a doubt the strangest cold case I have ever heard of. And it's more than likely going to be the strangest cold case I'll ever research ever again. It's a true cold case, a murder mystery, unsolved. So because it involves real people, if you do comment or you do share, please do use the appropriate sensitivity. So on with the story. Julie Pacer was 39 years old. She'd been born and raised in Grantham, Lincolnshire, England, and this is where she was still living at the time. She was married to her childhood sweetheart, Andrew, who had been married for 18 years. They were living together with two children, a 14-year-old girl, 11-year-old boy. The children were theirs. They lived in a four-bedroom house, which were in a nice, close-knit community. Their house was on Longcliffe Road, a well-built up, well-populated, affluent area. It was a nice place with nice houses and nice gardens it were all well kept and maintained nicely the only other thing to mention about the house was it was at the side of a piece of undeveloped scrubland um the type of place that dog walkers go up and down fairly often andrew was a self-employed plumber while julie was a part-time helper at a local day nursery on weekdays because she'd already be home she'd look after the neighbor's daughter so a neighbor's daughter would come home from school and her mom and dad wouldn't be in so she'd go to julie's She'd take care of her until the parents came home. Now that was every day except from Monday. Remember that because it could be important later on. All in all, the Pacey's family was described as happy, popular and outgoing. They had lots of friends in the area and having lived in that area all their lives, most of the families were quite close by as well. The 26th of September 1994 was a warm and sunny day. Andrew had got up early and left to go to a plumbing job on the other side of Grantham. Then a little later on, the kids got up and went to school. And then at 10 a.m., Julie left to go to the day nursery where she worked. The nursery was called St. Peter and Paul's Day Nursery, and it was about three miles away from one cliff road where they lived. She stayed at work till 2 p.m., and then she drove two miles to see her parents. She didn't stay at her parents' house long, and then at 2 30, she was seen shopping in Grantham. Julie was next seen at 2 45. She was parking her Audi car onto a driveway, and then at 4 15, Julie's daughter came home. She entered the house and she shouted out for a mom as she usually did, but there was no response. So she shouted out again, still no response. She went to the back door to see if she was in the garden, but the back door was locked from the inside. So she didn't bother. She was obviously not outside. So then she made her way upstairs, still shouting out. No response. She had to look around and didn't see her mom. However, at this point, the bathroom door was shut. So she, again, shouted out, presumably. And then she tried to open the door. But the door was quite stiff. So it took some considerable force, but she did manage to pry the door open and Juliet, her mom, was laid there on the floor. Now before we move on, I do just want to look about a bit of information a little bit closer. I haven't seen anywhere official that she was definitely laid against the door, but everything I've read suggests that she were and that's why the door were hard to open. But again, I can't confirm that as fact, so all we really know is the door was hard to open and Julie was laid on the floor in the bathroom. Regardless of that bit of detail, what is true is the 14-year-old daughter had now found Julie, her mom, laid on the bathroom floor with her tights and her underwear around her knees. Thinking her mom had become ill, she tried to wake her, she tried to revive her, and then she called 999. When the paramedics arrived, they also tried to revive Julie. But as they pulled her polo neck down from a black sweater, they noticed the laceration marks around her neck that showed she'd been strangled. After the police had examined the scene, they made a statement. There were no signs of a breaking, so we have to assume that the killer either walked in or Julie let him in. Probably Julie was surprised in the bathroom, yet nothing in the bathroom or bedroom was disturbed. There were no bruises on her body and no other marks except from where the ligature had been. This man probably opened the front door, walked up the stairs, strangled his victim and left. End quote. The rest of the house was completely tidy with absolutely no evidence of a disturbance or no evidence that someone had been searching for valuables. Julie's turquoise overalls from work had been hung on back of the bedroom door as it always was and the, in the house there was nothing out of place. The only thing that weren't in its rightful tidy place was Julie's handbag and a purse which were on the bed. There was also a half a cup of drunken coffee on the bedside table and on the floor at the side of the bed, there was an empty chocolate bar wrapper. Police said it appears as if Julie had come home from work like any other day, took her overall off, pinned it on the back of the bedroom door, had a coffee, had a chocolate bar, 
And then it looks like she tried to remove her makeup or retouch her makeup because beside her bag on the bed was some nail varnish remover. The police later determined that Julie had been sexually assaulted, but there was absolutely no signs of a struggle other than the ligature marks around her neck. It was even noted that her upper part of her clothing had been undisturbed and even her manicured long fingernails were perfectly fine. When the police searched the house, they deemed that all the windows had been locked and the back door was locked from the inside. They asked Julie's daughter whether the front door was open when she arrived, but she couldn't quite remember. And I speculate that it were unlocked because, first of all, if a door's unlocked and you just walk in, it's harder to remember if it were locked or not than if it had been locked. And also, if it had been locked, but her mom's car had been there, she might have thought that was strange and she'd have remembered that, but she wouldn't have been on such a search for her mom because the door had been locked. Do you get where I'm coming from? It's just speculation, but all we actually know is her daughter says that she doesn't know if the door were locked or not. The only thing that had been deemed missing was Julie's Luc de Roche watch. Now, she'd bought this watch two months prior while on holiday in Paris, and she'd been wearing it quite often since. It's deemed to be expensive, and it was thought to be the only one in the UK. Because it was the only thing missing, the police suspected they took it as a trophy. During the investigations, the police looked for any extra evidence about Julie's background, so if they were basically looking for any information if she'd been having an affair, or if she'd got fallen out with anyone, anyone that might want to hurt her, and they came back blank. They had absolutely no leads or connections to an affair, or people that might want to hurt her. They also searched for scrubland next to the house, they found absolutely nothing that could have been used as evidence or as a weapon or anything like that. They also spent time talking to dog walkers and absolutely nobody saw or heard anything. The police commented on this by saying you would have thought someone would have seen him arrive or leave or just hanging about but no one saw anything. Because Julie had been attacked in her house in the middle of the day it was thought to be a high risk attack unless it had been planned. So then the police started considering maybe it had been planned. Maybe this murderer had brought the ligature with them and then took it away with them. But remember, this was on a Monday between quarter to three and quarter past four. On any other day, Julie's next door neighbour's daughter would have been coming to the house at about quarter past three. But this was a Monday, the only day that she doesn't look after next door neighbour's daughter. So the police started looking at that thinking, well, maybe that this person had been watching her for some time to get some background information on when she's alone, home alone and that type of information but then the police quickly came to the conclusion that it was very unlikely that anyone had been watching her for more than a couple of days because it's a quite close-knit community and the neighbors would have noticed somebody watching her for a longer period of time it later came to light that julie had told her family of the incident that had happened the friday before so three days before the murder happened Basically, she'd been cleaning upstairs and then the doorbell rang. Expecting it to be the next door neighbour's daughter, she shouted, come in. When she went downstairs to greet the next door neighbour's daughter, there was a scruffy looking man stood inside. She exclaimed and asked what he's doing and he said he was just looking for directions and she shouted, come in, so he came in. Now, luckily for the evidence, as he entered the house, the next door neighbour's daughter was walking down the street and so he met her. And then as he left, she was walking up the drive, so they crossed paths. So she got a description of him. He was described as having a stocky build with a ruddy face, very prominent, extremely red cheeks, aged in his mid 40s and having an outdoor complexion. He was wearing a check shirt and overalls. There is an additional witness statement that saw Julie on the day of the murder, but it doesn't seem that this statement has been took as serious as the others. I think people doubt it a little bit, but this witness came forward to say at 10 minutes past three on that Friday, they were adamant they saw Julie driving down the road and a man with the description that we've just mentioned above stepped into the road. So as Julie slammed the brakes on, she waved at him as if to say sorry and then off she went on her way. And the guy that was about to step into the road that she slammed the brakes on for, he was walking, he'd already passed Julie's house and he was walking down the road. After this happened, he turned around and walked back towards Julie's house. And obviously the person saw Julie pull into her house, but they were getting in a taxi at times, so I imagine they'd gone. And they didn't see if a man had gone to Julie's house or just walked past or whatever. As I said, this person is adamant it was Julie, and they have used the same description of the man that had been given by the next door neighbor's daughter. 
So that was on the day of the murder, and police believe it's the same man that had been seen on the Friday before, three days before. Now, there were a lot of renovation work going on on the estate at the end of the road, so police have got the theory that he was either one of the builders doing the renovation work, or knowing of the renovation work, he dressed up in that way to disguise himself. So police did go down to the building sites and ask all the workers, or at least the bosses, if that man fit in anyone's description, but that led to no leads either. It was also then questioned why that man had gone into Julie's house. Obviously, she said come in, but why did he stop and ask her for directions? Why didn't he ask someone on the street? And there was obviously people on the street because it's thought that the next-door neighbour saw him going to Julie's house. So there were people on the street, why couldn't he just ask them? Or why didn't he go into a shop? I mean, I don't think I've ever knocked on someone's door to ask for directions. I've asked people that I'm passing or... I've phoned places or I've gone into shops, but I've never knocked on someone's door. That, that seems like a very, very last resort. It's been suggested that that Friday that he was asking for directions, three days prior, had been a failed attempt. He'd gone in with the intention to quit killing Jule or doing whatever he's done to Jule, but for some reason or another, it failed or he got too nervous. So he left and went and spent the weekend thinking it over and collecting his nerves and then went back on the Monday. But obviously that is just a theory. This man is unknown, he's never been found, so we have no idea if it's even the same man. And as I've just said, because he never ever came forward, this man, by the way, was dubbed Overall's man, um, that just strengthened the police's theories that this man was guilty. If he had been looking for directions, then why hadn't he come forward to say, yeah, that was me, I was asking for directions, I didn't say out dodge you know, or anything like that, so the police that were already suspicious of this man and now extra suspicious about him. Between being seen at Julie's house Friday and being seen on their road on the Monday of the murder, he was seen during the weekend in and around Grantham. He'd been seen in a park and he'd also been seen in a shop. Now, the reason it was remembered that he was in the shop is because he was quite close to the assistant in the shop and apparently his demeanour were quite aggressive. So let's just have a quick overview of this and recap. The house was fully locked up, the back door were locked, the windows were locked, the front door we don't know if it were locked or not but it's thought that he either walked in on his own accord or Julie let him in. And then Julie's found in the bathroom potentially blocking the door but we're not quite sure about that. She had uh, tights and underwear around her knees with absolutely no marks, no sign of struggle. The house is spotless as well and that's quite an interesting thing. Because even, just imagine someone strangling you. What are you going to do? If you're hitting them or you're grabbing walls, your manicure's going to get damaged or scratched or scraped in some way. It's very rare for the manicure not to be damaged. They are quite easily damaged. So even the strangling, she's not fighting back on, really. And there's no sign of bruising. There's nothing. There's no damage other than the ligature marks around the neck. And because of this, the police said... This shows a certain level of organisation and some really high level skills so that it's very unlikely that this is the man's first crime. And they said it's very likely that he has a history of sexual offending, possibly voyeurism, rape or indecent assault. The police were able to collect DNA and in 2014, so 20 years after the murder, they announced that they've now got an almost complete profile of the DNA. The police ran this DNA through their databases and came back with absolutely nothing. That means this man has not been arrested in the UK between 1995 and 2014. Bearing in mind this happened in 1994, towards the back end. Um, the police speculate that the man might already be dead, but nonetheless, they did reappeal for information. Because obviously now, if they get a main suspect, if they get a name, if they get a person, they can test that DNA against their DNA at the crime scene. Another piece of information that came about was around at the time of the murder, there was a blue BMW apparently parked outside of Julie's Audi on the driveway. It said that it might have been a 5 Series, but we're not quite sure on that. And despite appealing for information about this car or its driver or its owner, no information came to light. Before we move on to what happened later on, I do want to point out that the husband was cleared because his alibi checked out. There is a very strange twist to this story, 
And I do want to put it, put it out there because I don't want anyone watching this video and then the same happening again. But in 1994, a reconstruction was made for the TV programme Crime Watch UK. A 32-year-old man called Steve Watson saw the advertisement for the, playing the role of a murderer and he applied and got the job. Now, for anyone watching on the podcast version of this show, you won't be able to see, which is a real big shame, because I'm currently showing you the man that got the job and the photo fit of the person who the police want to speak to, and he looks almost identical. It is so uncanny how close of a resemblance the photo fit has to this man. Steve claims after the show originally aired, people in the street did call him a murderer, and he kind of passed it off as these idiots that didn't see the disclaimer that it was just a reconstruction and people were thinking what they were watching were real. But then in 2015, Steve now aged 53, the show re-aired, showing the reconstruction. When viewers from Newark saw Steve walking down the street, they spotted him, they identified him, and they phoned it into the police and reported Steve as a suspect. Subsequently, he was arrested and his DNA was taken. Throughout the ordeal, he claimed he was innocent and he just said, look, I just played the reconstruction guy, I'm innocent, this is absolutely ridiculous. Steve was later cleared because his DNA didn't match the DNA on the system that they'd got for the murderer. And that's fair, you know. The police said they'd be remiss if they did not fully investigate every solid piece of information. It, it is fair. If he matches the description, then he should be tested and he should be checked out. At the same point, it's not really that smart of Crime Watch to get someone that looks that much like the photo fit. Having said that, it doesn't really matter who played the reconstruction, does it? Because it'd have still been spotted as the person in the photo of it. So there you go, guys. That's all the information I have. And I think the thing that baffles me most is the fact that there was no markings on Julie whatsoever apart from the lacerations around her neck. I don't understand how a manicure can be okay. And again, there's absolutely no mentions anywhere that she'd been hit over the head or something. I, I, I don't know, would the post-mortem look at things like chloroform? I don't get at any point how this has happened. There is a major piece of the story missing in my eyes. There is no way she was just strangled without fighting back, without at least damaging her nails. I just think it's extremely bizarre. It would be very interesting to see what you think, so please do let me know down in the comments. Uh, feel free to share it. Please do share it. If you have any information, I am going to put the phone number for the Lincolnshire Police down in the comments. So if any of this rings true, if you're in the area at the time and you might have some information, please do contact the police and let them know. I, I, I assume you can do it anonymously. Obviously, if you're making a statement, it might need to be, I don't know, form the police and ask them. Uh, but if you do have information, please put it down below. Thank you for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to ring the bell. And please do, please do share it. Till next week.